Today on Living Power. We walk by faith, trusting obedience to the known will of God, not by sight. If we're living out life, uh, trustingly obeying God, then we have to know that what comes our way somehow fits in to God's will. Live for God Studio Productions. This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. Let's go to the Lord and and, uh, give him this time in prayer. Father, we are are so grateful for your love, for your compassion and your mercy on our lives. Uh, Thank you for for being so tender-hearted towards us, uh, even when we become obstinate and and, uh, tend to, to just look away or even walk away. But God, in your faithfulness, you have loved us and you have cared for us and you have welcomed us into your presence. And so this morning as we study your word, uh, we want to be in your presence and we we ask that you reveal yourself to us through your word. Then we might see something about our lives that you want to work in and through. And uh, we're grateful for that that privilege. I pray this in the holy name of Jesus, amen. In our passage today, we're in Matthew chapter 21 and we're gonna pick up with verse 18. Now, if you'll recall, the last uh, couple of Sundays, we're looking at Jesus. Jesus came. He did uh, the, the triumphal entry where he, uh, he rode the donkey into Jerusalem. Um, and we compared that with some Old Testament uh, things that happened that were similar. Uh, and uh, we just saw how God is in control and the things that he does, he has planned for thousands and thousands of years. And your life has been planned for thousands and thousands of years. That means that God is up to something in your life. And he chose you for this moment in time, for this place in history. I think it's amazing that you have been called to minister during the pandemic. Think about that. God didn't call anybody else to come minister uh, uh, at a different time. You were called for this time during the pandemic to represent Christ to the world. And that's a very, very heavy responsibility. I kind of wish we, I kind of, kind of wish that I didn't live during this time, you know, because that, that takes on a, a whole different burden that we have responsibility for. Now, we're not to be careless about it at all, but it is our responsibility because God has put us here at this place, at this point in time. Let's look at this passage in Matthew chapter 21. In the morning, as he was returning to the city, he's been out of Bethany. Now, he's staying in Bethany, walking back and forth, which is about a two, two and a half mile walk. Uh, In the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig uh, fig tree wither at once? And Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Now, Jesus used three elements to teach. He used miracles, he used parables, and he used the Word of God. That was the way that that Jesus taught. That was the way that he represented himself to the people. He used miracles, he used parables, and he used the Word of God. And whenever Jesus performed a miracle, uh, it was always somehow connected to the narrative of what was going on. There was, it was a, the miracle was just part of a bigger picture, in other words. Um, so when Jesus performed any miracle, he was always teaching something. The miracle was just part of the teaching process. It was part of his ministry, but he just didn't do miracles to do miracles. He did miracles to teach something greater. For example, when Jesus fed the 5,000 men, and we don't know how many women and children were there, but we presume maybe another 10,000, so it could have been anywhere from 12, 15,000 people there. Um, That miracle was a beautiful picture of God's provision and care for those he loves. And right before that miracle, that miracle of feeding the 5,000, in Matthew, Matthew says that a great crowd had followed him into a desolate area, and Matthew states he had compassion on them and healed their sick. And as it got later in the day, uh, and there was no food for the people, uh, he took the five loaves and two fish that that little boy had, and he multiplied that, and he fed the whole crowd. And then there was 12 basketfuls left over. 
Jesus used that healing and that feeding of the 5,000 to reveal God's love for them, his care for them, his watch care for them. He used that. There was a bigger picture than just healing and feeding 5,000 people. It was all part of this expression of, I want you to get that how much God loves you. Jesus' very first public miracle was when he turned water into wine. You remember that story. Uh, it's described in the second chapter of John. And at that miracle, he displayed his authority over nature. And then immediately, he went into the temple courts and cleaned them out, just as he did in the last few days of his ministry. And in that action of cleansing the temple, he displayed his authority. I have the authority to do this. And the miracle was kind of a predecessor, if you will, kind of an expression of his authority. He was proving who he is, that he does have authority to do these things. And that is exactly what Matthew has done here in this passage. He points out this miracle of causing the fig tree to wither as a representative of what we're about to witness. So we can, if we can understand what this miracle is all about, that will give us insight to understand the confrontation that is about to follow between Jesus and the hypocritical religious authorities in Jerusalem. Now, the most common interpretation of this miracle is that the fig tree represents Israel and how Israel is cursed for not bearing fruit. But I really think that is way too broad uh, of an interpretation because there are a number of issues. First of all, it wasn't fig season yet. Uh, so why would God curse a fig tree for not bearing fruit when it wasn't even fig season? Um, and here's another question. Matthew's narrative says that Jesus was hungry. Why would Jesus go to a fig tree, presumably to pick some figs, when it wasn't even, they weren't even in season yet? Um, then, why would Jesus react so harshly toward the fig tree? Poor little fig tree. Why would Jesus do that to a poor, innocent little fig tree? You know, we kind of read that story and we go, ooh, why did he do that? Well, let me give you a little botanical insight into the life and times of figs. The Gospel of Mark uh, tells us that it was not the season for figs, um, but that the tree had leaves. When fig season approaches, when it's almost fig season, the fig tree begins growing leaves. And at the same time, it grows little buds um, on the tree, the end of the branches. And those buds eventually turn into figs. But even before they turn into ripe figs, the green figs are edible. They don't, they're not sweet, but they're still edible. And so the leaves indicate that even if not fully ripe, the tree is producing some fruit. Sometimes, however, if the tree is unhealthy or it's diseased, uh, the green figs don't appear or they just fall off and all that's left are the leaves. That was the apparent situation with, with this particular fig tree. So why didn't Jesus just go on to the next tree? If he was hungry, why, why didn't he just go on to the next tree that would have had figs and fig buds, and he could have eaten? The reason is that Jesus uses the condition of this fig tree to make a point. And he makes an interesting statement that is really poorly understood in English. Jesus speaks, and he says in verse 19, May no fruit ever come from you again, and the fig tree withered at once. Now, it sounds that Jesus is cursing the tree, that he's mad at the tree. But a better way to say it in English is that Jesus said, No fruit will ever come from you again. He wasn't saying, All right, that's it. You're never going to bear fruit again. What he was saying was, an, was, was uh, the tree was of no value because it can't produce fruit. He was just simply making a statement. He was, he was not cursing the tree, as some preachers and teachers have said. In fact, you don't find that anywhere in the Bible that says that he cursed the fig tree. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't that. He merely pointed out the reality of the situation. And here's the miracle. The fig tree withered at once. So Jesus didn't curse the tree. Jesus just pointed out the obvious. This tree was already diseased. Uh, it couldn't bear fruit. And Jesus just said, you're never going to bear fruit again. And so the tree withered at once. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I, th I think it would be incorrect to interpret this miracle as the fig tree representing Israel and being cursed for not 
uh, bearing fruit. Rather, I believe Jesus is making a statement about people who make it a show or appear to bear fruit, but are in fact spiritually barren. And in fact, as we'll see over the next few Sundays, that's exactly what Jesus reveals as he confronts these hypocritical religious leaders in Jerusalem. And he strides into the temple, and he cleanses it, and he chases out the abusers of what was supposed to be a house of prayer. And as we saw last Sunday, at the same time, he welcomes and heals the sick. He's delighted in the praises of children. Jesus was still being Jesus. He was still ministering the way he always ministered. But now he takes on the responsibility to confront the hypocrisy, the fakery of those who pretended to be religious. And by his purity and by his authority, he shone the light of truth on that hypocrisy and that fakery of the religious leaders. And these are the ones that Jesus finds to be fig trees without any fruit, of no value to the world, and worthy of only withering up and drying because they have no interest in being real. They're just simply putting on a show. They bear, they're bearing leaves, but they're not bearing fruit. And, and uh, so we're going to look at all that, but we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves here because before Jesus goes into Jerusalem to confront the religious hypocrites, he answers the disciples' questions about it. So let's look at that. That's what I want us to see today in Matthew 21, verses 20 through 22. Uh, 20 through 22. When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Now, this little passage, and actually these two verses, verses 21 and 20, uh, uh, 22. Jesus basically defines what spiritual maturity really is. And what he's saying is that you're going to, this is spiritual maturity. You're, what you're going to see in Jerusalem over the next few days is not spiritual maturity. Just because these religious leaders have religious positions and they know so much of the law and they dress so eloquently and they speak so grandly and they pray so immensely, boringly, shallow, this is what spiritual maturity really is, verses 21 and 22. And so what he's saying is this is where you are headed. This is where you're to go. This is what you're to be. You're not there yet, but you're heading that way. And he gives them the four basic elements of spiritual maturity. And he says, this is what I want out of your lives. This is where you need to be. So let's look at these four elements of spiritual maturity. The first one, he says, is faith. And he says, truly I say to you, if you have faith. Now, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this because I've taught this to you ad nauseum. And I know you already know the definition of faith, which is trusting obedience to the known will of God. But there are many people who are online, I'm sure, that, that this is new to them. So I want to explain this real quickly to you. We tend to define faith, and the Bible says that faith is, in, in Hebrews 1, it says that faith is the evidence of things not seen, the, 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 what is it? <laughs> what is it? Yeah, hope, hope for things to come, the evidence of things not seen. Man, I, I've known that all my life, and I still can't remember it. Um, so, and so we define faith that way. But the word itself is actually made up of two words. It's trusting obedience. And every time we see in the Bible, every time we've seen in the Bible examples of faith, it's always people who knew what God wanted them to do. Noah, there's an example. Abraham, there's an example. Gideon, there's an example. And Hebrews 11 declares that these people were men of faith and that there were many, many others throughout the history uh, that were faithful people, that pe were people of faith. And the reason is because they already knew what God wanted them to do and they did it. So faith is not just wishing. Faith isn't stepping out and saying, boy, I hope this is the right thing. I hope the Chiefs win today. I'm going to have faith that the Chiefs are going to win. That's not faith. Faith is trusting obedience to the known will of God. And so I want us to keep that in mind, that concept of faith, because I want you to look at the next element, which is no doubt. Don't doubt. Now, it would seem that doubt is the opposite of faith. Because Jesus says, if you have faith and do not doubt, it sounds like those are opposites. But that's not exactly right. The word 
for doubt literally means to intentionally separate yourself from something. To intentionally separate yourself from something. And often by opposing or disputing something. So in other words, the idea is that if I disagree with you and don't want to have anything to do with you anymore, that's what this word doubt means. I've doubted you. I've intentionally separated myself from you. Uh, I'm opposing you. I'm disputing your position. That's the idea of doubt in the Bible. When the Bible talks about doubt, doubting God, that's the idea there, that you separate yourself from God and you oppose or you dispute something. So the concept here is that on the one hand, you trustingly obey um, the will of God, the known will of God, and on the other hand, you don't separate yourself from God, and you certainly don't oppose or dispute God and his ways. So it's a choice. It is, spiritual maturity is a choice. It is a choice that I am going to trustingly obey God, and that I am not going to separate myself from God. I'm not going to turn my back on it. I'm not going to oppose God. I'm not going to dispute God. Listen, there's nothing wrong with asking God why. But there is a lot wrong in telling God why. You see, when you disagree with God, it's usually, because, it's usually out of ignorance. You don't really know what's happened. But if you become angry at God, and you just say, I don't want to have anything to do with you, God. You're wrong. I can't believe that you would let that happen to my life. I can't believe you did that. That's doubting. That's separating yourself from God. Prayer, prayer is the third thing then, the third element, and you'll see it there in that passage. Um, it says, verse 22, whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive. So the third element is, first is faith, second is no doubt, the third is prayer. And prayer is such a weak point for most Christians. Uh, not that we don't pray, we do. But we pray according to our will, according to our needs, according to our concerns, according to our circumstances. We usually pray about us or things that we, that we sense in other people's lives. We pray selfishly. Not that we're feeling selfish, but rather that it's all about me and what's going on in my life and what I need. Next time you pray, just, just acknowledge yourself when, when you're praying along. Uh, notice how many times you say I and me. You know, it's, it's, we pray about ourselves. And, and it's amazing because that's not real prayer. By the way, there's something else that's not real prayer. I, this is just a pet peeve. This is a little parenthesis. You're getting this for free. Why do we say when somebody suffers, you know, they, they have an accident or, or some, some, somebody dies in the family, and you'll see this on social media all over the place, oh, prayers to the family. What is that? You're not praying to the family. Why do you say prayers to the family? It'd be healthy to pray for the family, but you don't pray to the family. <laughs> So I know this is just a colloquialism. We say that, well, oh, prayers to the family. Well, it's not prayers to the family because that means that you don't really know what prayer is. You pray for the family. Now, that's, that's the end of the parentheses. And if you want to leave a tip, that's good. But, um, but it, it was free. Uh, we, prayer is, is, is something that we do basically because we feel like we need it. And there's something that we want. And God is the great Walmart in the sky, and so we need to go shopping. And, uh, but there are many, many words in the Bible for prayer. Uh, probably four, maybe five different words in the Bible for prayer. Uh, there are words that mean that prayer is a petition. There are words that mean it's like a, like a request or a supplication. There is a, a word that means to worship. It's considered prayer, prayer or prayer is considered worship. There is another word that means to, to request or to, to ask or to desire or to entreat. That is also a legitimate word for prayer. And then there's a word that means to make a supplication. In fact, the Bible tells us to make, let our supplications be made known to God. That's prayer. But the best way to define prayer is the concept of prayer, which is communication with God. That's what prayer is. Prayer is communication with God. But remember, communication is a two-way street. 
Communication is a connection with someone that elicits a response. There's a great tattoo for you. Communication is connection with someone that elicits a response. And it could be with words. It could be with actions. It could be, you know, it, there's a number of different ways that, it, that you could communicate with somebody. But communication always elicits a reaction or a response. So ladies, if you, you talk to your husband and he's not paying attention, you haven't communicated. You've talked. You know, you've made your, you've let your, your wishes be made known. But if he's not paying attention, you're not communicating. And uh, because communication elicits a response. Now, his ignoring you may be his response. But if it's not intentional, it's not really a response. So get this. Prayer is not just you speaking to God, but it is also God speaking to you and you responding to him. That's really important to understand. Prayer is not just you speaking to God, but it is also God speaking to you. And remember, communication uh, requires or elicits a response, and so you respond back to God. Prayer is back and forth. It is a back and forth communication. It is, it is a two-way communication. Look at some verses that talk about this. Psalm 143, verses 7 and 8. Answer me quickly, O Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, or I will be like those who go down to the pit. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. It's that focus on God. I'm completely dependent on you. I'm trusting you. I'm asking you to reveal yourself to me. Then in Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. That's that idea of making your supplications be known to God. That's prayer. Prayer is, is not being anxious, not that we're going, oh God, you wouldn't believe the mess I'm in right now. And God's going, yeah, I know. You know, it's, 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 it's don't be anxious about it, but realize that you can come to God with thanksgiving, and present your request to God. Colossians 4.2, devote yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful. So, you see, prayer is not about how spiritual you are. It's not about what other people think. It's not about words. It's about being. It's about the presence of God. It's about connecting with God in his presence and not only realizing that God is going to also speak to you, but he's going to expect you to respond to what he says to you. Jude 20 explains it this way, which I love. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of people have suggested that that means that you're praying in tongues. That's not what that's teaching at all. What that's talking about is praying within the will of God, in the presence of God. You're praying right where, you're right where God wants you to be. And you are praying because, remember, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. And you are praying empowered by the Holy Spirit. Listen, true prayer happens in relation to the Holy Spirit. True prayer happens in relation to the Holy Spirit. Now listen to this. Anything less than praying in the Spirit is just wishing. So prayer is communication with God that elicits a response both from God and from you. And Jesus said part of spiritual maturity is that you have faith, you don't doubt, and you pray. And then there's the fourth element of spiritual maturity, and that is receiving. Do you see that? Or whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Now, this is an interesting element to spiritual maturity. We're generally not good receivers, uh, especially in America. We find it difficult to receive unrequested help, unsolicited advice. You know, we, we just, we're just not good receivers. You know, uh, you know it's, if somebody came along and there could be somebody that's just freezing cold and somebody came along and just said, here, take this jacket, they go, oh, no, 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 I don't, you know, somebody else needs it worse than I do. We do that. We're like that. You know, we're not good receivers. But the Bible says this, if you don't know how to receive, then you don't know how to give. If you don't know how to receive, if you're not a good receiver, you can't be a good giver. 
In fact, Jesus told his, his disciples in Matthew 10, 8, freely you have received, freely give. Now, I want you to see this because receiving is part of a cycle. It's, it's the part of, 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 of a giving cycle, if you will. As you receive, you are to give. As you receive, you are to give. That's the idea of receiving. When God gives you something, it's part of his giving cycle. And you receive it so that you can give. If you break the chain of, of, of the giving cycle, then you break what God is up to. You stop what God is up to. When you receive, you receive to be able to give. You receive so you can give. That's what God wants. And when you receive something from God, it's proof that God is up to something in your life and up to something in someone else's life through you. Think about that. You know, we talk, and Daryl, you're just going to get picked on because it's your fault. Um, but Daryl received a life, a new life. He received his life back. And so if he just stops there and says, oh, cool, I got my life back, and doesn't understand that God's up to something through his life, then he's missed the whole point. We receive so that we can give. That's the whole concept of receiving. It's part of the giving cycle. Now, notice the caveat for prayer and receiving. And whatever you ask in prayer you will receive if you have faith. Now, remember these two things. We, basically, if you pray in faith. Now, that means praying knowing, knowing the will of God. You're praying knowing what God's up, that God's up to something. And you may not exactly know what it is. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But knowing, you pray, you're praying in the will of God. Secondly, you're receiving in faith. You pray and receive if you have faith. You're receiving in faith. You're, in other words, you're recognizing that what you receive is the will of God. So you pray knowing that, that you're in the will of God, and you receive knowing that you're in the will of God. Now, does that mean that if you don't know the will of God, you shouldn't pray? It absolutely does not mean that. <clears throat> the Bible very clearly says that there's going to be a time when you just don't know what to pray for. There's not going to be a time. There are going to be lots of times in your life when you just don't know what to pray for. You, you don't know how to pray for something. And this is what Romans 8 teaches us about that. Romans 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts, that's God, he who searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So the idea here is that the Holy Spirit knows the will of God, because the Holy Spirit is God. So when you don't know what to pray or how to pray, just let Holy Spirit intercede for you. Just let the Holy Spirit do the talking. When you don't know what God's will is, uh, that is especially the time that you need to be praying that God's will be done. And if you don't know what the will is, that's where, and Holy Spirit does know what God's will is, then that's where you just say, Holy Spirit, I don't know what to pray for here. Take over. And you are praying. That's praying in the Spirit. Letting Holy Spirit guide your prayer. Now remember, you're still praying. That means you still need to be listening to God. It's not like, okay, Holy Spirit, you take over and you leave. It's not that at all. It's that you're there, part of that process of communication where you're relating to God and he's relating to you and you're connecting with each other. And then, here's, here's, here's the, the, the follow-up to that, and then when God answers prayer, believe that what you are receiving is God's will. may not be what you have, were hoping for. may certainly not be something that you expected. But it is God's will if you're there in his will. Nancy Simmons and I were planning Barry's graveside service last week. And 
uh, I asked her to send me some of her favorite verses, and uh, she emailed me, and she said, this is my favorite verse. I have it in my kitchen, and I see it every day. It's 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We walk by faith, not by sight. And I, I thought, what a remarkable verse to hold on to when you have to bury somebody you love. But that verse says exactly what Jesus was saying. Pray and receive in faith. You know, if you pray, God, you know, whatever your will is, whatever your will is, ooh, I don't like this. And you're praying for God's will, and God answers you, and then all of a sudden you're complaining because God answers you. You missed the point, didn't you? We walk by faith, trusting obedience to the known will of God, not by sight. If we're living out life uh, trustingly obeying God, then we have to know that what comes our way somehow fits in to God's will. And back in Romans, what we looked at about the Holy Spirit interceding for us when we don't know how to pray, the very next verse in Romans says this, Romans 8, 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So here's my question for you. Are you called? The answer is yes. According to his purpose? The answer is yes. God is up to something in your life. He has a purpose and a plan in your life. And if you're praying for God's will to be done, then you have to expect that God's will is going to be done, and whatever comes your way, it fits into it somehow or other. May not be the complete picture, may not be the complete answer, but somehow or other, it fits into it, little by little by little. So there you have God's concept of spiritual maturity. Faith No doubt, prayer receiving as part of the giving cycle. So, let me ask you a very personal question. How are you doing? How are you growing? What is God up to in and through your life? How is he accomplishing what he wants to accomplish? How are you growing in that process? And just like what Jesus said to his disciples, you're not there yet. This is where you're going. I want you to get to this point where you have faith and no doubt, and you're praying and you're receiving as part of the giving cycle. That's when we begin to see spiritual maturity in our lives and when we know that God is, is pleased and he's going to continue working in and through our lives. Now, that's the end of the lesson. Uh, yay! I saw, I saw some of you get so giddy. Um, by the way, thank you for knowing that it's the end of the lesson and not getting up and walking out. That's, I, I appreciate that. Um, so, any questions about this? This is such a really important part of, of understanding what is coming next what God's up to and, and what, he's, what Jesus is going to be saying and doing. He's basically said, this is what I want, and these guys that I'm going to be confronting over the next couple of days do not have it. And that's what Jesus is addressing over the next uh, few parables that he, that he gives. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. That's a, great, that's a great question. The question is, how do you know if you're praying in the Spirit? Let me change the word Spirit and just say uh, to pray in God. When you pray, because the Holy Spirit is God. So when you pray in God, that means that you are in God's presence. That means that you, and by the way, you can't enter God's presence with sin. You've got to confess that sin. It's like, you know, you take a, a, a sterile glass of water, sterile glass of water. If there's one little speck of dust in that water, it's not sterile. And so that's the way it is with God. When you come into the presence of God, he's so pure that if you come in with a speck of dust of sin in your life, then the presence isn't pure anymore. So you have to confess your sin and come in before the Lord pure, right with God. So praying in the Spirit is basically another way of saying praying in the presence of God. You know, you're, you're with God, you're connected to God, you're speaking to God, 
your sin has been confessed. You are, you have, you, you're obedient. You know that you've done what God wants you to do, or you're in the process of doing it. So praying in the Spirit or praying in God is, think of it as praying in His presence. Am I in His presence, am, and am I really seeking to connect with Him? Recognizing that praying means that I'm going to respond to what God says to me. And a lot of times God won't respond to us or God won't answer us because he knows that we're not going to respond to him. So why should he say anything? So listening and understanding that God is going to speak when we're in his presence and we're right with him uh, and recognizing that the, and admitting that we're frail, we're human, but our intent, our heart is to respond to God and to do what he wants us to do. That, I think, is the idea and the concept of praying in the Spirit. Does that answer your question somewhat? Anybody else? I think somebody else started to say something. Yes, sir. Yeah, the, it's a great question. Should I preface my prayer with a confession of sin? Um, I think so. I do. I mean, I think you can, you know, I, I, I look at the Lord's Prayer, and it, the confession of sin is in the middle of the Lord's Prayer. And it's almost like, okay, I'm standing out on the edge, and I'm saying, uh, uh, you know, um, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And then confessing my sin. Once my sin is confessed, then I can, then now I'm in his presence. It seems like that. But I think it's more, uh, we can't, I, I, that's too, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That's too limited. That's too human. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's more the sense of, I mean, God knows if we're going to confess our sin. So it's not like, oh, you can't come in here until you've confessed your sin. God knows you're going to confess your sin. I mean, if, you do, if, you, if you're planning on it. So it's, it's, don't take it so literally that, that, and legalistically. It's the idea that I'm going to be right with God. When I leave his presence, I'm going to be right with him. Not that I'm going to leave his presence, but when I walk out of that condition of prayer, I'm going to be pure and right with God. So, I, but I will tell you that I do start my prayer life with confession of sin. Um, and, it's, it's, uh, and I really do believe there's a greater connection with God immediately uh, when I do it that way. I just feel like I know that I'm right with God, that, uh, I'm, that he's, he's forgiven me, and that uh, he's, he's welcomed me into his presence, and, and, and we're ready to, to communicate now. And so I, that's my personal thing. And I, if other people do it other ways, I, I'm certainly not going to quibble about that. But I think it is a, a significantly important part of the prayer life. And, uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's an old acronym that people use, ACTS, for praying. Acknowledging, uh, C, confession, T, thanksgiving, S, supplication. And, um, or A, meaning adoring, not acknowledging, but adoring. God, and so that's a suggestion for a prayer style, to, to start with your, your adoration of God and, and praise for God, and then confessing your sin, and then thanksgiving, and then supplications. Um, but, I, you know, if you follow that, if that helps, great. That's, you know, you should do it that way. But it's important that you do, I think, make sure that your sins are confessed and forgiven before you leave that prayer time. And there are going to be a lot of times when you don't have time to, you know, to go through that whole process of praying. You gotta, you're, you're, you're in a quick situation. Lord, I'm about to lose control of this car. Uh, wait a minute, I need to confess my sin. Uh, you know, <clears throat> no, it doesn't happen that way. Sometimes you've got to get busy quick. <laughs> um, does that answer your question? Yeah. All right. Yeah. No? Sure. Valid. Yeah. Total valid. Yeah. Okay, I got you. I got it. Here, 1 John 1, 9 says this. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So the confession of sin means, God, I realize I'm a sinner. I realize I'm out of your will. Sin is being out of God's will. It, and uh, sin is the idea, I'm, I, I am out of God's will because of something that I've done. And so I confess my p 
position of being out of God's will. And then God says, I forgive you for that, and I'm going to cleanse you in the process. Now, uh, I, I had this conversation with my, uh, my father-in-law, uh, and he, he, was, he was a smoker. And uh, he wanted to quit so bad, and he would quit, and then he'd start up again. And then he'd quit, and he'd start up again. And he says, I just feel like I can't come to God and ask him to forgive me again. Uh, because he, he's just gonna, he's just, oh, you're just gonna do it again. I said, Richard, here's the thing about, about God. This verse very clearly says that when you ask him to forgive your sin, he forgives your sin immediately, but the process of cleansing you may take a while. And so if you're dealing with a sin that is repetitive because you're a drug addict or an alcoholic or something like that, and you're dealing with a sin that, that, that keeps coming back, that you keep having to deal with, just know that when you confess your sin, God, you've cleaned the slate. So God has a greater permission. You've given God greater permission to continue the cleansing process. And for some people, it's a very quick process. For other people, it may take months, even years. You know, but the, but the confession of the sin is immediate and the forgiveness of the sin is immediate, but the cleansing may take a, a, a process. Gotcha? Okay. Anybody else? All right. What an intelligent group of people here. It's either that or there's a football game you want to go watch. All right, so um, let's go to the Lord and let's give him this time of, and, and uh, seek his face. Father, thank you that your word is, it just comes alive when we recognize that you are up to something in our lives. And we can trust you for that, and we depend on you, and we wait on you. And Father, sometimes we get tired of waiting, but Lord, you're, you're at work. And you are uh, a faithful God who says that you will do what you say you're going to do, and We've seen that in our own lives. So, Father, I pray that you would uh, continue to, re to be real to us. Um, and as we discover how we're supposed to grow spiritually, Father, make those, those elements true and real in our lives. I pray in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Now, next Sunday, we continue the study on who's in charge here. And the idea is, uh, now Jesus goes and he confronts the... Uh, the hypocritical religious leaders, and uh, that discussion starts, and then there's some parables in there. So we're going to take we're going to take our time and go through that. But I think you're going to find it really interesting and, and applicable for you, for your life. Okay, all right. I'll see you next Sunday. Go away. Love you guys. On behalf of Dan Hurst and the Open Class, we want to thank you for watching. We hope it was a blessing.